um, in the remaining 15 minutes, let's get started on part two, which is, is gapped phases, or at least, well, not all gapped phases, but a very large class of gapped phases. So as I just said, we just talked about the ground state problem, the scope, I define the S source RG, okay. Now what are we gonna do now? So now I'm gonna to try to convince you that most ground states with the gap that you've thought about are S source fixed points with S equal to zero or one. I'm gonna show you first trivial case where S is equal to zero and then talk about the non-trivial case where S equal to one. And then at the end I'm gonna, I probably won't get this till, till the after lunch, but, but I'm gonna talk about a little about the definition of short range entanglement. Because this, this perspective has a slightly interesting take on this. So here's the definition again. It's S source fixed point of D dimensions. If I can take the wave function on size L, take S copies of it, throw in some product states, mix them all together, and produce the wave function on size 2L. That's the definition. And so the goal will be to construct the unitary U. That's what we were trying to do. And just, just so it's clear that you know the scheme here is that you want to, once you have this, you know, for every L you can do this, you can make the wave function you know, recursively by starting with size L, relating it to L over two, and then L over four, then L over eight, all the way down until you reduce everything to a single site or some small cluster. And this will take at most log L steps so that you can write the whole wave function in terms of product states with a log L depth quantum circuit. Okay, but as I said, the key thing is to construct this unitary transformation. So let's go back uh, to the trivial case where I have an insulator with one particle per unit cell and some alternating weak and strong bonds. And I said I wanted to form these bonds to zero. And there's an obvious guess for what the unitary is. It's just adiabatic evolution, right? If I just adiabatically evolve the system, that's roughly going to give me the right ground state. And that's true as far as local properties are concerned. But if you want the true many body wave function to have unit overlap, before and after, you have to do a little bit better than that. But actually, we know how to do better than that. And the way we do better than that is something called quasi-adiabatic continuity, invented by Matt Hastings and all. Shagong also wrote a paper with Matt about this many years ago. So here's the setup. I have a Hamiltonian, which I call H of one, which is the Hamiltonian of interest. And I have its ground state here. And I suppose there exists a path in Hamiltonian space called H of eta, a gapped path, so the gap remains open along the entire path, which, which connects H of one all the way back to H of zero, which is a Hamiltonian with a product ground state. So suppose you grant me this path. So what's the path here? Just multiply this bond by some number x and change x from one to zero. That's the path, the gap always stays open. So that's a Hamiltonian path, which connects you from this interesting ground state to a product state. Okay. And then what I claim is that we can construct a Hamiltonian, a sort of fictitious Hamiltonian, which I call K of eta, which is indeed quasi-local, and which generates the time evolution as a function of eta. So if you think of this wave function, psi of zero, and psi of one as being part of a family of wave functions, psi of eta, and you think of eta as like a time, then we can construct a quasi-local unitary, or quasi-local generator, or Hamiltonian, which generates this time evolution. So the job of this generator actually, what this thing is doing is it's just, when it hits the ground state, it gives you first order perturbation theory. That's all it does. So you know this uh, matrix element over energy difference, that's the job of K, to produce this, this, this thing. And here's actually how it works. You, uh, I need, a, I need a, the help of a function, special function. So F is a function of time. It's rapidly decaying. It actually can't decay exponentially fast, but it can decay faster than any power. It should be odd. It should have the property that its Fourier transform is minus one over omega for omega bigger than the gap. So this is per perturbation theory, right? That's your formula for, for um, the energy denominator. And finally, that the Fourier transform at frequency zero is zero. 
And you see that the reason why it can't be decaying exponentially is because it's smooth but not analytic in frequency space. So it can only decay faster than any power. It can't decay exponentially. Otherwise, it'd be analytic in a strip. So with such a function, which you can easily construct, it's not too complicated, you form this object. You integrate over time, weighted by this function, of the time evolution with the current Hamiltonian of the derivative of the Hamiltonian. So it looks complicated, but what it's doing is it's taking the matrix elements of the perturbation and putting the energy denominator in the bottom. And then when you hit the ground state with this object, it gives you first order perturbation here. So it's really not a, it's not a complicated object. It just requires a little bit of uh, calisthenics to do it correctly. But OK, you can make it. And as long as the gap is independent of system size, then you can prove that this k is local using Lee Robinson bound. Or you prove it's quasi local. And so this is why we need actually quasi-local, because this f doesn't decay exponentially. It decays only faster than any power. OK, but so that's it. I showed you there's a quasi-local Hamiltonian or generator. I just integrate this time evolution from 0 to 1. That produces a quasi-local Hamiltonian, which is exactly what I needed to do to relate this ground state to this ground state. So indeed, any such system where the Hamiltonian is gapped and there's a path to a product state, and time of order 1 is s equal to 0, which is, of course, what we all knew anyways. So what's f and, and theta? Oh, sorry. This is the function in, of time. This is its Fourier transform. Okay. And uh, is the functional form important? Uh, not so important. Um, there are many functions that satisfy these properties. You just you can try to optimize it if you really want to do something with this, but we don't need anything more than this crude information. So I want to emphasize that the, you know this this you know this depends on the path that I choose. It depends on many things. So it, it may not be the, the optimal unitary to take you from the state to the product state. There may be other unitaries that work faster or better that do it in less work, but this is a unitary which which achieves it for any such function. Uh, but when, when you change uh, yeah. Do you change the number of levy sites? No, in this case you don't. You just change the whole thing. So it's like a very phase? Like a very phase. Well, it, it's just like I'm just adiabatically deforming the Hamiltonian. That's that's essentially all I'm doing. Yeah, actually let me let me address this point a little bit more now. This this Y quasi adiabatic. So imagine for example you have this this Hamiltonian which is the sum of decoupled spins. Right. So all I want to do is I want to rotate the local magnetic field from z to x. So you can do adiabatic approximation. right? We know, OK, you do this slowly compared to the gap. Then with very small error probability, you'll go from pointing in the z direction to pointing in the x direction. That's fine. But there will be some non-zero probability of error on any given site. You do it adiabatically. And then when you take a bunch of sites, you put them together, there's a small error epsilon. The total probability to reach the final ground state is 1 minus epsilon, but for every site. So it's to the L. So if you fix epsilon and take L to infinity, the overlap will be 0. And why is this? It's just because somewhere in the system you create an excitation. So it's orthogonal. Of course, all the local properties look almost the same, but globally the state is different. But you can say to yourself, you know, Brian, you're stupid. Why would you do this adiabatic? You just just use y to rotate from x to z, right? That does it exactly. And in fact, if you calculate what k is for this Hamiltonian with these properties, you'll find it's exactly proportional to k, to, to y. So k is just another unitary, I mean, another Ham Hamiltonian, which exactly generates the flow that you want. And what I'm telling you is that if the system has an energy gap, you can always find such a k at the mild cost that it has to be slightly non-local. It has to have these tails that decay faster than any power. But at, at some mild cost in terms of locality, you can exactly map ground state to ground state. Okay. So what I've shown you so far now is that for s equal to 0, the ground state, I mean, sorry, sorry for, for a gap Hamiltonian, which is 
the form will show a product state that grounds it as equal to zero. And this is essentially what, what, what you've always known. And just one, I guess I'll stop, I'll stop after this, but let me just make a comment about how to relate this to a circuit definition. You can always take such a quasi-local unitary and break it up into blocks to approximate a circuit. And the way you do that is you would take the Hamiltonian and say on these, these sites here, throw away the bonds which connect you to the outside world, and time evolve just with that Hamiltonian. That's manifestly local. And then what you do is switch to an interaction picture with respect to that Hamiltonian. So you've taken care of all the terms in here, but there's a remaining link that you haven't done correctly. So take this link and switch to the interaction picture with respect to the original, these block Hamiltonians. That will smear out this term a little bit. There'll be some tail which is created, but it's still more or less local. So then you can evolve with just that more or less local term and all you have to do is truncate at the tails. So you have to, you have to, you have to cut things off a little bit at the edge, but that cutoff can be you know, suppressed faster than any power of the size of these blocks. So there's always a way to go from the circuit, I mean, to go from the unitary Hamiltonian evolution to the circuit with controlled error for any local quantity. And in fact, you can, you can actually get even error for the total state, which is vanishing an element of infinite system size by making these blocks that were a law of system size. So if, you know, for a 10 million by 10 million system, you only need to look at like, you know, a block of 20 by 20 or something like that. That's sufficient to have overlap, high overlap with the true ground state. So this is just to say that, that you can go from the local unitary to the circuit definition more or less freely, as long as you don't care too much about these very delicate issues of overlap and thermodynamics. Okay, so this is a pretty picture. Let me stop here. When we come back from lunch, I'll tell you about the more interesting case of S equal to one, which includes topological states. So thanks very much. We have time for a few questions. How can you make sure that you have always finite gap between the ground state and the fast-rate collision state during the real time? Well, so yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's indeed a crucial point. I, 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 you have to give me the path in this way of thinking. So you just have to assure me that there is such a path. Then I know this unitary exists. If I don't know that there's a path, then I can't tell you that it exists for sure. So you have to give me the path and, and assure me that it's gapped. I mean, if it's not gapped, I can tell that it's not gapped. Like something will break down. But but I can't. You know, I, I need to know this path in order to do this. So is it the same as solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation? Not necessarily. You could imagine, you know, well, but I have two answers to this question. One is that you could believe in principle there is a path and not know it. And that will guarantee that this unitary exists, but you don't know what the unitary is. So then you could try to find it a different way. You could try to find it variationally, for example. The second thing is that it may be the case that you actually know for some reason that there is a path with a gap, but you don't know, you know more than that. that. That information obviously is the same thing as knowing the entire spectrum or solving the, the full time of equation. So in fact, well, what I'll actually appeal to later is your general belief that I can deform gap systems locally to make this, this true. And, and you know, although I don't you know, specify the exact path, well, sometimes I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you next, you know, Exact path in some cases, but, but yeah. yeah. You mentioned this uh, using first of the perturbation theory can overtake the evolution. Yeah. So why don't you using the standard first order uh, perturbation theory of wave function? And uh, so, so if that's correct from some choice of an F function, which is a little too similar. No, no. I, I, it is it is first order perturbation theory, but but first order perturbation theory is not a unitary transformation, at least not naively. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not cast in that form. Okay. So of course, you can always find a unitary which rotates you, but maybe that unitary is not local. So the, the, the point of this is to construct a, a local Hamiltonian evolution, which, which gives you first order perturbation theory, but it also has nice properties. Theory is kind of unitary, but the error is a second order. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unitary. Unitary. 
yeah, so I, yeah, exactly. I take the limit and I get a unitary. The only thing is it's not clear that it's local. And indeed, in general, it won't be local. But nevertheless, if it's a gap, we can construct it. Any more questions? If not, I thank Brian again.